Kids want to live. Kids want to feel alive. They want to change the world and see what happens. Hello, my name is Theodore, and this is Teaching Kids to Code with Elm. Uh, I'm going to start out by explaining why I think it's important that we teach kids to code. Then I'm going to continue with a journey through our Elm Learning Programmer Hero. And finally, I will try to pull out some conclusions. Why teach kids code? How I came to think that this is important. So, as Eric said, I have a background in uh, civil engineering. That means I've been working with how, how we can ensure structural integrity, how we can ensure that the buildings that we build are safe and sound and, and that they stay up. And for very many years, this industry has been exactly the same. And up until uh, the 80s, 90s, basically the only thing that was done was you had hand calculations and you had one guy who knew how everything fit together. But things have changed a lot since then. As of now, we are using uh, numerical models for basically everything that we do, because it's simpler to use. But as we're starting to introduce these numerical models, we, we, we get these huge data sets. So you have lots of data that you just have simple tools to handle. And it's the same people that do these jobs as it were previously. So you have a huge variety of technical competence in a field that really needs programming. Because we know that if we're going to touch a huge data set, we're probably going to do programming. We're not going to try to find a visual interface that lets us solve every problem we have. And in order to make this work, we need professional programmers. Pro professional programmers who are able to build good systems that are useful. But we also need a foundational programming knowledge across the board. We need the people who are doing uh, related things. We need them to be able to customize and configure and do the small things. And that is why I think it's important that we give everyone a foundation in programming so that it's simple in the same sense that you can pull in some math when you need it. So how did this end up? Uh, I started contributing to Oslo Code Club in 2016. And in 2017, uh, I took initiative to start a course in Elm. Uh, and uh, the course was structured uh, with uh, 10 lessons during 10 weeks. Uh, the kids were from uh, about 12 to 16. Uh, they had some prior experience with Scratch and simple Python programming with Turtles. Uh, it was at the University of Oslo, Brinan, and I want to thank Erik Osmundru, Alexander Perry, and Kjæran Silde for helping me pull this, pull this up in the beginning. So, what does it look like? What does it look like when our hero is learning, learning Elm? Elm is Legos with magic bricks. Elm is kind of like Legos, because you have these small components that you can compose and build into bigger, bigger components, uh, and they fit together. It's not this huge mismatch. Uh, you can generally take this thing and fit it into there. But at the same time, it's not like Legos at all, because Legos is static. When you build something with Legos, a Lego car, you can move it around and the wheels are turning, but it's never going to do something unexpected. And you can't have that meaningful interaction with the car. It's like you're, you're, you're thinking, uh, how do I want to build this? And you're designing the whole car, and you're building the car, and then you're done. But that doesn't account for change. So we need some magic, and we need some ability to interact with what we're doing. And Elm does a lot of things right in this area. It's so easy to get up and running and have, have a live interaction feedback loop with, uh, with Elm, where you just you punch in your code, and if you make an error, you get feedback on that. If you uh, make something graphical, you can see what that is, and that's a very dynamic flow. And, and together with, 
with the guarantees that the static typing gives you, I think that's very right. So, our hero needs some magic tools. Every hero has magic tools. When I started out with Elm, uh, I figured that uh, the kids probably want to program Elm as I do. They want an editor, and they want to see what they're doing, uh, and they want the compiler so that they can run the compiler and build HTML files. I was totally wrong. When I started out, uh, LA didn't exist yet, so we used TryElm, which is basically the same, uh, but stripped down. Uh, in both cases, you can, you can write your Elm code in a web browser and see the web page or the compiler errors on the right side. And that reduced so much complexity. They didn't have to download anything, they didn't have to learn about links, they didn't have to learn about HTML files and CSS files and how to do the script tag, because that's solved problems and that enabled us to focus on what we actually wanted. And we actually, we, we wanted to see kids build interesting stuff with programming. We need a shield as well. We need some way to protect us from, from what can go wrong. And as programmers, I think that shield protects us from wasting time. And when we have the compiler as, as this thing that we can have tell us when something bad happens, we have, we have a single layer of possible errors. Uh, it's not like you get this huge stack trace down and you see like something weird happened on all these stages and we don't really know what's wrong, so we're just telling you everything. But with Elm, we can actually see what was, what was wrong. We can get meaningful feedback because that's, that's a part of, of the workflow. Finally, something as Elm programmers we often take for granted, the browser. The browser is fantastic. You can write code that runs everywhere. When we had Python, we, we did the programming and we set up everything on, on the computer where it was supposed to be used. And we only used it on the same computer. They were only able to run the scripts on their own computer and kind of show them, hey, look what happens. And that, that didn't really seem significant. When we're using Elm, we can, we can put it on the internet and we can send a link and we can actually share it. So we can share it with friends, we can share it with grandma and, and they can actually see it and they can play with it. So given that we now have our tools, what were the challenges in our journey? Some challenges are self-imposed in order to learn. Other challenges just appear and we have to handle them. The first task I would like to pull forward, which is not the exact same things we did, but, but we worked with SVG. Okay, so this is a real task, but it's not the first task. I'm just showing you two tasks, that's what I'm trying to say. Uh, and with Elm, we can, we can write the code and see what happens. And you can, you can see the things moving, and it's really simple. You have a compile button that you press, and then either you get, get feedback on on uh, whether you did something right or whether you did something wrong. But we need to explain some things. And like coordinates, what are, what are coordinates? I can't take that for granted when I don't know the level of the kids who are coming to, to watch this. Like, do they know how this works? And why is the y-axis going down? And I figured this must be a huge problem because now we have to do math teaching as well. But it turns out that this wasn't really an issue because we had this live, live feedback loop and we kind of, uh, we gave them some Elm code which had the wrong dimensions and asked them to try to fix it. Try to make the, uh, the circle large and the rectangle really flat. And coupled with a really simple figure that shows that, okay, so you're kind of, you're working with these pairs of numbers and when this, the, the right pair uh, increases, we go down. And when the left pair increases, we go to the right. And that was all that was needed. There was no, no abstractions, not like, yeah, the, the y-axis is wrong, going the wrong way. We never had to say that because Elm provides an immediate feedback loop to what we're using. So, 
another challenge, this one was involuntarily and not really something that we um, were trying to search out. Um, when you give kids some tools to draw rectangles and ask them to draw many rectangles or some kind of composite, they have never used functions before. They don't know that they can use a function to pull out what's common. They don't think that it's unnatural to see shared code all the time. They, they don't see that they could have like made a my rectangle function that draws their correct rectangle with, with the properties they need. So this, this problem is hard. Like teaching someone how to make good abstractions is hard. It's hard. Uh, but in the end, that also was, was kind of, w one point is accepting they're not going to design the code as you do, and that's, that's totally okay. And uh, on the other way, you, you can't provide abstract arguments. You have to show them. You have to show them, this looks nice. Give them good examples. Give them examples where you've extracted the functions that you see uh, convenient, and, and let them reuse that. At the same way, when we create examples, show the meaningful abstractions and, and don't make a big fuss out of all of it, but try to make the experience nice. And I feel that this ties very well into what's been said previously at this conference. So this, is, uh, th this was the most, most fun uh, task we had. Uh, Stefan Kreitmeier uh, has made a game called Elm Joust, which is basically a uh, two-player uh, Super Smash Brothers, where you control, uh, both, both players are on the same keyboard, and they control one ball each, and they're supposed to tilt the other ball off the stage. So we started out, yeah, well, you need to know what this is, so group yourselves into pairs and play. <laughs> and <laughs> kids being asked to play, yeah, that's really simple. But it's also motivating because that now they're engaged into it. They're like, yeah, well, what is this thing? So we're trying to dig one, one layer deeper. We're trying to find out how can we make one meaningful, one meaningful difference. And uh, let's make it pink. Yeah, so um, before we come here, uh, we, we pull down the source code, and I kind of I, I try to explain that this is a typical Elm project. There are multiple files. Of course, you need to have the file system set up for uh, for this to to work. But this is this is it. And now you can build your own version, and you could change some text by changing things here. And and this is how you interact with it. And interacting with this source code was simple because we have the types. There weren't any implicit guarantees. If it's still compiled, it still still runs. So we were able to kind of reach way higher than we were supposed to be doing. I mean, kids with, yeah, so uh, 10 weeks of prior programming experience at age 13 was able to make make changes to a game. But we didn't really stop stop there, so we're thinking, we want to change change the rules. We want to change the rules further down. What about if we change, change the physics? What about if we change the gravity? The gravity is just a number. And the reaction that that gives in a child when the child sees that, oh, I'm able to do this. That's the change aspect I'm talking about. So we have we have the static, static system, the solid ground, and on top of that, we can build something that's really flexible. So change the gravity, that's simple. Uh, we finally managed to figure out where the collision happened. So you have this collision and the two balls and they're hitting each other and they're turning away in a different direction and you're kind of, you're conserving momentum and kinetic energy. Uh, but what, what happens if you, if you increase some energy, you put some energy in there, you get a little explosion. And that turned out to make the game more fun to play. Uh, we just made it so that every time the balls hit each other, we increased the speed of everything a little bit, so that it kind of looked like they flew away. And that was fun. That was fun for me as well as the kids. So, conclusions on the way forward. What, what have we learned from this? 
I was kind of trying to test this thesis. Is, is it right to show them show them Python first? Is it like, does Python make more sense? Uh, does it make more sense to have one thing happen one stage at the time? Um, and I found that not to be the case. You need some way of interacting with what you're doing. And if you're doing something that happens one state at a time, you can print it, and that makes sense. That's the way to explain it. But when you have Elms, other mechanisms for giving feedback on uh, what you're doing and showing them, like you have the compiler that can show you the error, and you have the browser that shows you the real results, then that did not turn out to be a problem for us. Too many moving parts may get you stuck. Um, as adult, <laughs> adult programmers, uh, we, we tend to have some scar tissue on uh, long procedures we have to follow and make zero mistakes. Uh, I once tried a, uh, a slightly difficult Linux distribution called Arch Linux, and I totally got myself up into a corner where I had done a bunch of things and I never knew where my mistake was, so I didn't know how to get out of it. And I found this to be fundamentally easier with Elm than, than other environments, because there I could control the quality of the feedback that I could give when something was wrong. I will just repeat that uh, once again. L let's try to enable others to make magic. And I think uh, in an Elm sense, a lot of that happens on, on making a combination of solid ground and making it changeable. Those two things, when you can create things that are stable and flexible at the same time. So, uh, I would like to say a, a huge thanks to Teach Kids Code as well. Uh, if you're interested in contributing to Teach Kids Code in Norway, uh, this is the URL. Uh, the URL is also uh, later on these slides, so if you watch the presentation later, you can find back the slides and find all the links. If you want to uh, pursue this train of thought further, uh, I recommend all of Brett Victor's material. Uh, Learnable Programming is a fantastic interactive essay where he kind of he shows some text and explanations with code and visualizations where the visualizations are connected to the code. Very high quality. If you want to go in a different direction and kind of see what does this mean on a philosophical ground, uh, you can look at uh, Jean-Paul Sartre and Simone de Beauvoir's work. And if you want a nice introduction, I haven't read the original sources, but Philosophize This, number 106, was something that clicked for me in this context. Uh, and I've written about it uh, myself as well. Um, this is a slide link, primarily for the YouTube video. And thanks a lot. Thank you to you for listening. Uh, thank you to the Elm community. Thank you to Teach Kids Code. Thank you to my current employer for doing important work and letting me uh, do this. Uh, thank you to the organizers. Uh, thank you to Peri Erik and Charon and to Lisa for making me lots of coffee. Thank you.